Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. I hope you guys have been having a great week. I most certainly have. I am doing something brand new today, something special, something that I'm excited about. I am now starting a segment where I play a track from an unsigned band that I am a fan of. This is my unsigned gem segment. Today's track is by a band that I used to play with way back in the day before I was in Cryptopsy when I was in Three Mile Scream. My brothers from Montreal in Sinistry are back, and I am super stoked about that. I'm going to play you one of their tracks right now. This is Dead to Me on Vox and Hops' Unsigned Gem. <laughs> are back. I love it. I love it. Mad love and respect to my brothers who are finally back after taking, I I think it's an over a 10 year hiatus. They're back. Uh, Check it out, people. If you enjoy Sinistry, please go and check out all of their social media links, which I have included in the description of this podcast. Go and follow them, like them, send them some love. I am stoked to see where this unsigned gem ends up. I have a specification about the upcoming episode you are about to listen to something that is very important that I want you to understand. This episode was recorded on Tuesday, November 10th. So this is over a week ago that I sat down to record this conversation. So anything that you are hearing in this conversation is not valid as if it came out today. So please keep that in mind. This was recorded on November 10th. So anything that is being said happened over a week ago, and you will understand as the conversation goes on. On today's Vox and Hops episode, I am with Mike Lacouture of Broken Goblet Brewing and Trevor Phipps, the vocalist of Unearth. Get ready, people. This is Vox and Hops episode number 204. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everybody? Today, I'm with Mike Lacouture of Broken Goblet Brewing and Trevor Phipps of Unearth. I am super, super stoked to be with you both. Uh, I reached out to you wanting to have a chat with both of you because you guys are doing something super cool together. 
and it was something that I wanted to showcase, promo, and talk about on Vox and Hops. Uh, before we get to that, though, let's uh, start with how I've been starting all my podcasts recently with a very simple yet complex question. We're going to throw this to each of you in turn. How have you been coping with 2020? You, you take this one first, Mike. Well, um, today, one of our employees uh, was positive for COVID. Fuck. So this has just been, I mean, that kind of sums up the year we thought we could maybe get through it. Uh, without that happening and so it was just awful and what it reminded me of was just how awful it's been for everybody in in, in the brewing industry the music industry the production industry service industry everything that's affected about how they've been having to deal with this and manage this nightmare from a financial perspective from hr perspective from every you know what do you tell the public it's just it's been awful so coping we've been okay um, as a brewery um, but we, you know, we were set up as a music venue brewery, which was the best business model ever until March 15th. And then it became the worst business model ever. So uh, all our money went into production and sound and lights and not into canning lines and stuff that you would need for takeout. So it's been rough, but we're, we're coping. We have a really solid, um, fan base and people that care about us and supporters. So they've kept us kept us floating and kept us alive. Um, but it's been tough. So today sort of is encapsulate capsulatory of everything. Yeah, COVID, COVID hits home today. Absolute, absolute garbage. And uh, so sorry to hear that. Um, that venue behind you is so cool. I'm going to cover that in a bit. But uh, let's see how Trevor has been coping with 2020 first. That looks like a nice venue when I'd, I'd like to play. It's, yes. it's really cool. Um, so we, 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 we did a tour right through the, the very beginning of COVID, and we finished our last show was on February 29th in Europe. Uh, so and we played Milan on the 22nd. Uh, so we, we had some, some time, some, some experience with it uh, right before it blew up over here. Uh, since then, the band's been you know, on a slight hiatus. We haven't done a lot, but it's just recently been um, the fire's been kind of lit to, to write that, the next record. And we were talking a little while about doing... Um, uh, an online show, but then when the numbers started going up again, once we started that that, that dialogue, um, there's been restrictions on who could travel um, from where. And our drummer Nick lives in Washington State, and our, our bassist Chris lives in Fort Worth, Texas. So it's it's it'd be difficult to get them here without you know, uh, you know with following all the restrictions. But it's something that we we're we're still trying to explore. Um, and I have a bunch of ideas of, of how to do that. And you know, d depending on how long this, this uh, anti-live show thing goes on uh, until we can safely play, um, you know, we might do some stuff online. But for now, the focus is on writing a new record, um, at the very least an EP, just get, get new stuff out there. But besides coping, I uh, spent a lot of time with family. Um, I have two, two, two young kids, um, and we did a lot of camping this summer. A lot of family time, a lot of home improvement as well. Um, been doing some some side gigs to help make ends meet, and um, we're we're still standing, doing well. We have to, we have to, and it is very very strange for us musicians to spend a whole summer at home. But it, it's it's really nice to spend the time with the kids. I got two kids as well, two kids, and nice. uh, it's it's just it was a blessing to spend a whole summer at home versus slaying out all those festivals in Europe. <laughs> it's you know for the the timing of it, we were approaching probably the last six months of the album cycle for extinctions. Um, so it was almost a time where you get a little burnt out in the cycle. Um, so it's the time with the kids has really um, helped soften the blow of, of the madness of the world, you know, so I've been really soaking up that time. Special, special. Um, let's dance into, you know, Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends and talking about their lives, music and craft beer. Now, Mike and Trevor, what beers are you guys gonna be drinking? and sharing with me tonight. Is it the same beer? Is it different beers? You start first, Mike. Introduce the beer that you're drinking. So I'm drinking the Black Hearts Now Rain. A little bit over 10% Russian Imperial Stout. How about you, Trevor? Uh, I just finished pouring um, the Finback Rolling in Clouds. Uh, it's, um, Finback is one of my favorite breweries because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a IPA guy, especially the New, New England style, more of the hazy. Um, I do appreciate West Coast, which is, if we make it to a second beer, I've got one in the freezer now chilling. Um, it's called Bounce. Um, 
but I, I do go back and forth between uh, West Coast and, and uh, New York days, but usually the hazy is, is my favorite. But uh, Broken Goblet did send me some beers, and uh, their oatmeal stout was phenomenal. And uh, so I'm excited to try ours, our, uh, our big boy. Yeah, that one's great. Delicious. Absolutely. And this is exactly what I'm about to crack and uh, share it with you guys right now. This is the noise reduction oatmeal stout, but it's a different one because it's nitro. And uh, I normally always, 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 whenever I do interviews like this, I always use my branded glassware. But you can't do that with a nitro stout. You know, you got, you got to do a hard, vigorous pour. So I'm going to do that now. While I do that, and I hope I don't spill it everywhere, if I do, <laughs> it will be funny. Um, take me to your first beer. Mike, do you remember the first beer that you ever drank? First craft beer that I ever drank? Um, no, first, was, first beer. <laughs> it, was black, it was Black Label from my father. The Black Label was like a shitty, you know, kind of adjunct light lager um that i believe i think came out of canada actually but my dad was originally from canada and so black label was the first beer i ever had in my you know had in my system and i i can't say i was a huge fan of it at the time no nope, black label sucks and it is from canada 100 percent right there <laughs> how about you trevor do you remember that first beer i do um my first one ever in high school um my friends and I went to a place called The Pit, and there's a town next to ours. The, the, the town was Linfield, Mass. And my buddy, who had become the guitar player in my first band, um, buddy Chuck, he brought um, a 12-pack of MGD. And we had a few beers by a fire, and it was, it was great. And I, I have a soft spot for Miller Genuine Draft to this day, just because it was the first beer I ever drank. It's not my favorite, but I'm, I'm a craft beer guy entirely, but, you know, it's... If I if I have it, it's it's um it's, it's good memories. That nostalgia, it's let's say going back to the, the the first bands you listen to. There's there's even if your palate for music has evolved since then, there's always that weird little warmth that makes you want to go back to it and listen to it and enjoy it and oh, taste yeah. it again. <laughs> Most definitely. How about the, that first craft beer, the one that changed everything, the one that changed your mind? You you go with this first, Trevor. Uh, well, I was lucky enough to have Sam Adams here so for for us that you know it's you can't really call it you can't equate it to the the craft beer that's going on around now but you know talking about when i was growing up <clears throat> my early 20s sam adams was good so i liked i liked all the beer i liked i liked killian's when i was younger you know when I, just to, to branch outside of the the regular you know budweiser's and millers and cores it was you know i was trying different stuff so that for me was my introduction to tasting something different but what I'm going to say is the, fir the first IPA that got me to really change my mind on beer, because of course I drank those beers, they, they were delicious. I wouldn't consider myself uh, almost you know, only an exclusive beer drinker at that point. Um, and then I tried Dogfish 60 Minute IPA. And I was like, what is this flavor that's so different <laughs> than everything else? Because I've had Harpoon IPA, which you know, it's a fine beer, but it doesn't taste like this. And... Um, <clears throat> Now, 60 Minute is now almost like the, the beginner IPA for me. So uh, I'm just, I keep on trying you know, different, you know, variety packs of different IPAs. Um, I've, I've gone, I've, I've dipped into sours and stouts and, and porters, but I keep on coming back to the um, IPAs and doubles. Um, and that's just what my palate likes. Absolutely. And you're from Boston, so the haze game is just so so on fire from there so, so there's no you know it's insane it's and that like so my, my band jokes that you know i'm a beer snob now which i was never really a beer guy for years and uh i've gone around the world looking for you know hazy ipas and it's, it's like an inside joke with us but the world is catching up most of the world does have quality hazy ipas now absolutely and it's a it's a true pleasure on tour to go and you find that rare gem and you're you're in germany and you're like another pilsner oh and then and then finally you find some haze and it's 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 awesome <laughs> i remember uh, sorry it's, it's a real no, quick story ahead. about buzz my, my guitar player he he got into the craft beer game before i did and i remember it's like 2012 or 13 and he was really bummed out on tour about the beer he's like i hate the beer i'm like what are you talking about we're in europe you get great beer man and he was really upset about it and 
fast forward two years and I figured out why. It's like, oh man, he's used, he's already in the craft game. And so you get burnt out in the Pilsners. Uh, I do like a good Pilsner, but after, you know, day after day on tour, it's, it's a bit much. So I, sorry to interrupt Mike, but that was just my quick story. Nice. But... <laughs> Don't worry at all. Just it'll be, it's a natural flow of a conversation. Mike, how about you? That first craft beer that changed everything. I think, I think it was Magic Hat number nine. So I used to go snowboarding up in, uh, in, at Killington and Mount Snow. And my, my, my dad, uh, when he moved to the U.S., he was in uh, Exeter, New Hampshire. So we would go up to visit that area a lot. And we would, you know, do kind of snow, snow shit um, in the surrounding states and whatnot. And, um, and Mount Snow and what. So, but in, I remember distinctly in Killington that there was this, beer I, I forget where it was some restaurant had this magic hat number nine and my sister got it and let me have some and magic hat is like uh it was really an early fruited ale you know there weren't a lot of beers doing raspberry kind of infused ales at that time i mean that was like trev said that was you know the 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 base ipa sierra nevada pale ale was big um, you know, uh, brown ales were big. Of course, Guinness was, was always there. But Magic Hat, you know, and for, for a kind of a younger dude who was not sure he liked beer at the time, you add fruit to it, and all of a sudden it becomes like it's, well, this is almost not even like beer. It's literally like <laughs> taking liquor and then pouring in orange juice. Like vodka was tough to drink, but a uh, screwdriver was great, you know, that, you know when, you were, when you were younger. You didn't understand the nuances of the liquor. So it was probably Magic Cat number nine. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, like you, you mentioned Beer Snob, Trevor. We, our band was, st was strictly a high life band. Even at the end when we were, you know, when I owned the brewery and we had access to all the best beer, when we were sitting in our trailer, which we called the Vatican, because it was like, oh, these, you know, all, all, you know, our rules and it's our own little city state. We had high life on top of high life on top of high life. Um, because we never really got away from that easy to drink, can have a lot of them still be able to play, you know, mm. as, you know, in metal, you kind of have to make sure you are somewhat able to play the stuff that you're trying to play. And so we, we just stayed with high life. And, um, and to this day, I'll probably get crucified and I don't fucking care. You know, it's been one of those days and we have a 30 pack of high life in our walk-in. So we've got all this crazy craft beer. And then we've got at least one 30 pack of high life, if not more. Um, okay. that we'll dip into periodically because sometimes you just don't want all of the adjuncts and all of, well, that is adjunct. You don't want all the fruit. You don't want all the crazy shit. You don't want all the yeast from the beard and you don't want, uh, you know, triple sour, double dry hop with this and this and this and this. You just want something easy and memorable. And so High Life is our, is our jam. Mm, the, champagne, the champagne yeah. of beers. It is. <laughs> this is amazing, Mike. Thanks, man. Thank you. It's it's amazing. Super multi bite. I love it. I love it. I love we're, it. We're a stout. Like we stouts are our favorite things to make. Russian Very Imperial cool. Stouts is our probably our favorite beer to make and stouts in general. So that's why when we were thinking up this this uh well it wasn't a collab at the time, when we were thinking up this beer, we wanted it to be a stout. Very cool. Yeah, I wanted to dive right into that right now. Uh Black Hearts Now Rain this collaborative stout between you guys and Unearth, uh, the Russian Imperial Stout with white chocolate, which will be added to it. Uh, <laughs> all of the proceeds are going to the ACLU for Philly and Boston. Uh, tell me about how all of this came together. How exactly did this collab come to light? Well, we, so our bar manager is a guy named Reese Dunlap, who was, the, was actually the singer um, in our band, the band that, we, that I was in when we met Trevor and Unearth. What, uh, what, what band name was that? The uh, so band's name, Beyond Dishonor. And uh, we were a pretty heavily multicultural band besides me. Um, so we had, uh, uh, we, our, our singer, Reese is black guy. Um, we had a guitar player named Wes, and he was um, of mixed race. We had an Hispanic bass player. And we really kind of tackled race head on from Reese's perspective. We kind of followed, you know, me and, and Mark, who's the other guy in the band, um, we, the other, other white guy in the band, we, we sort of followed their lead in terms of we're not in a position to understand what's going on from a racial perspective. 
Um, but we know that we want to be a part of whatever they feel strong about. And so our band really tackled race pretty hard. So when all of what happened with um, George Floyd, and even before that, but when the George Floyd thing hit, um, clearly it was, a, you know, it was a lightning rod for the entire world and, and the United States too. But there was immediately a, uh, some collabs that were going around the country. And one of them was called Black is Beautiful, which is great. And it was from a, 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 obviously a, a, a black gentleman um, who owned a brewery who kind of came up with this idea, give the recipe to different breweries and let them do it. So we had gone to Reese and said, hey, you know, we want to be a part of something here. We want to do something, make a statement, use our platform. What, what do you want us to do? And his response at the time was, I want us to keep doing what we're doing and not jump on any other thing and when the time is right, I want us to do something that's our own um, because that's kind of how we've always been. We were that way as a band. And, uh, and so we said, okay, we're going to follow your lead. So I'll, I'll try to make this faster. Sorry. So when we got to the time where, um, you know, I think kind of the powder keg was hitting after the Floyd stuff, um, we went to Reese again and said, you know, what, what's your thoughts? And he said, I have this idea. This is what I'd like to do, but I'd like to connect it to music somehow because we're such a musically inclined brewery. So, you know, what I want to do, he told us a beer idea and he said, you know, I, and I said, okay, that, that sounds awesome. Like, let's do it. And I said, you know, what are you thinking for the charity? He said, um, I think ACLU is the right one. They're just a great, it's a really good organization. They, you know, they don't pigeonhole themselves in one area. They, they really are a multifaceted uh, support group. And so he said, I said, what are you thinking about for the name and the branding? And he said, well, I'm kind of thinking of either calling it darkness in the light or black hearts now rain. And I'm like, I'm on the phone with him. I'm like, so we're just, we're going to just make an unearth beer. Is that what we're doing here? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, it just, you know, it makes sense. And he, and he conceptually had an idea for what he wanted to do. Our graphic designer, Mark, who was the, the guitar player of the band, the other white guy I was talking about. So we're on a call. We're all talking about it. At the end of the call, I said, um, you know what? Like, I, this is stupid, but I'm just going to text Trevor from unearth and see if he remembers me. Um, and just throw it out there and see if he's interested. So I texted him. And, you, want to, uh, you want to pick up this story, Trevor? Do you remember yeah. that text? You could, I do remember the text. And uh, but <clears throat> what's funny is we've been kind of eager to get in the beer game for a long time, but we've, we haven't been approached at all. And we're not going to, you know, force anyone to make a beer for us. And then Mike hit me up and they brought us a bunch of beers when I think you guys were first starting back in 2014. Uh, that was, was that around the time you started, Mike? No, we, that was when we had just gotten signed. But that was, I was telling uh, Matt no, before that, you yeah, came with, on. With, that was, with, uh, this is hardcore, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. With, yeah. with, your, with your beer, because you guys brought us a bunch of beer. Yeah, yeah. That, and we, we hung out and drank, and drank a bunch of beer. So, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> that, that, that was a, a good memory. Anyway, um, it was. so he, he hit us up with, with the idea, and I was, I was, I was honestly blown away with, with the idea behind it, uh, just because of the whole climate in America right now and, and just around the world. And um, it just seems like the, the, the appropriate way to, to lend our voices to, to, you know, the troubles that we're all seeing. Um, and it's, and it's, it seems like it's almost a daily occurrence at this point. Uh, and it's been happening for a long time. You just turn on the news and you see um, the things that are happening, the inequalities that are, that are happening and just the, the injustice. And it was, it's, it's been upsetting for all of us and to be part of something that can uh, raise awareness, continue the conversation and to donate to the ACLU was a, a, a no brainer for us. If, you know, to, to be included with a bunch of cool, cool, cool guys that we did a lot of shows with, you know, about five, six years ago. Uh, so we had a relationship with, it was, um, it was something that we were excited to uh, jump into without, without any questions asked. That's amazing. And this beer is going to be dropping on November 21st which is tomorrow, people, because you guys got to go get this beer. Uh, it's a broken gobble brewing. Where can people get the beer, uh, Mike? So I have a feeling that it's going to be a, uh, like a, there's going to be a huge push just based on the, the messages and the social media kind of presence. So right now it's only available at the brewery in uh, right outside of Philadelphia where we are. If there's any left, we may put some up for our statewide shipping just so people, I, I got a message yesterday from somebody who's driving four hours to get it. Wow. So, um, you know, that's, that's damn near three quarters of the state of Pennsylvania. So whether we need to ship or not, I'm not sure. 
but um, we, we'll see. And then this is just the first batch of this. I mean, and, and uh, Trevor, you could probably speak to the stuff that we talked about with slow, but you know, we have ideas to sort of spread this out a bit. And then, uh, and then obviously we, we would like to rebrew it here again at a larger scale. Yeah. We're talking to other breweries um, about getting that, that distro that's, that's needed for independent breweries. Um, and we have, have one up here, uh, our old bass players, uh, John Maggard, uh, nicknamed slow. He works at a brewery. So we're in talks with them. Um, but you know, nothing's, Nothing is uh, solid yet, but it's, it's, it's something that we're working on to get it out there. Very cool. So it would be like the Black is Beautiful, but the Black Hearts now reign going from brewery to brewery. Yeah, we would give him the recipe and give the brewery the recipe, and then they would just make it, you know, put their own branding on it. But that, that would solve all of the interstate troubles with trying to get beer. You know, I, I tried, and it's, I had some conversations, and they're still ongoing with Night Shift. He's up in, in the Massachusetts. Um, and that's still happening, but we're, it, it's so hard with the rules that are in place to ship beer that, you know, we needed to find somebody to be able to distribute it up there. And this way it would be way cleaner because it's like, here's the recipe, here's everything you need. You brew the beer, here's the label art, you know, you just swap out logos and, and, uh, and it's, and it's great because it's a connection to unearth, you know, with, uh, with slow. Mm, absolutely. And it's, but it's also that another person putting their, their hand in the the pot of the message and spreading mm -hmm. that message into with you know more humans involved being good humans and I love that. Yep. Exactly. Uh, let's talk a little bit about music before we started recording. I told Trevor that uh, he looks just as good as that first show I played with him. It was in Montreal, Trevor at Lex. I love don't know that. If you remember playing Lex with the with the staircase that went up and the people could watch you all the way yeah, around. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big reason why we enjoyed it because, I mean, of course, shows in Montreal are always unreal. Uh, but that uh, venue, Lex, uh, with the, the balcony around you, it just felt like everyone was so close to you and they were on top of you. So just it, it lent to the underground metal and hardcore vibe um, entirely. Absolutely. I think it, Norma Jean was on that tour as well. And we opened it up. My, I think it was either my first or second show with like an international touring band so so i i was very excited <laughs> and it, it was a lot of fun <laughs> yeah that venue is, is unreal I'm, I'm bummed it's gone um but there's all kinds of great venues to play in in uh in montreal and looking forward to getting back as soon as possible absolutely montreal loves you uh speaking about gigs do you guys remember your first gigs the first time you ever played a show what show would that have been and tell me about that experience you want to you want to take that first Trevor? Sure. Uh, first time I ever played a gig, um, I can't even really call it a gig. Uh, it was my birthday party. I think I turned 15. It was just my backyard, my parents' house. My parents told the neighbors, you know, it's going to be noisy for about 30 minutes. And it was my, my high school band. And we just played in my backyard just to get the cobwebs out, you know, or just uh, the, the jitters out, I should say. And about a month later, we played our first show at, at uh, like a restaurant. And it was... <laughs> <laughs> glamorous first gig but we built up from there and uh it was you, you played it to no one at first and then built up pretty quick hey, absolutely and i i played my parents backyard we got through two three songs and the cops pulled up and that was the end of that <laughs> gig it was actually a band practice i don't know what the hell we were thinking but <laughs> mike how about you how about that first time on stage I was a, I was late. I, I didn't, I taught myself how to play the drums in, in college. So um, my first show was with a, I taught myself how to play the drums by watching. Don't laugh at me. I would watch dream theater videos that would always focus on Mike Portnoy. And, and I would watch him and I would just watch it and rewatch it. And I set a TV up next to the drums so I could watch it and watch it. So I, I basically learned how to play really complicated polyrhythmic drumming. But at that time, nobody was like, there was nobody wanted to start a band like that. So I joined a beat down hardcore band and uh, we played a VFW in New Jersey it was the very first show we ever played. Um, and it, I'm sure it was a clusterfuck. I don't really remember all of the details of it, but it was everything you'd expect about a VFW show in the early 2000s. Um, probably, uh, you know, not that many people. They were only there to see their friends. They didn't give a shit about you and they hoped that you, that you suck so they could throw stuff at you. But I, I do remember it distinctly. Um, I do remember it distinctly. And we covered a Slayer song 
And I remember the guy, like the janitor or the custodian or somebody that was sort of overseeing it, um, didn't have a problem with any other band music. But when we played, I, I, I don't know what we played. We might've played Hello Eights or I don't know what we played, but I just re- distinctly remember this guy being really offended visually. So your first show, you're all nervous. <laughs> and I'm like looking and I'm watching this guy and he's just eyeing us up like, we're, like he's going to pull the plug on us and the 14 people that are watching. So I remember that. That, that was my one vivid first show memory. That's you don't know which place have you played? In Jersey? No, your first show. You remember which, which layer cover you played? Uh, I think it was Hello Eights, but we also used to do a cover that was like Angel of Death, South of Heaven, and I had a whole bunch of songs that we had written into a, a medley because I was a prog guy. So I'm like, it's got, it's got to be a medley. It's got to be 11 minutes long. You know, it's got to showcase every talent that I've taught myself in the last three years. But, you know, we're like a, you know, it was a hardcore band that covered, we, we were all over the place. It was, you know, it, I didn't really find myself until I got in the, the band that I was in for the long time. But my, I don't. My first band had a medley, a medley too, and it had, had a dead, dead Skin Mask in it. Ah, that's it a had, good one. It started with Paranoid, Dead Skin Mask, and then uh, Thunder Kiss 65. Dude, oh. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were just that's playing cool, that man. at the brewery the other night so loud. Um, it's the old, the old Rob Zombie stuff, man. The white Zombie stuff. White Zombie stuff, yeah, man. Yep. That's cool. Should have been, been in Boston, man, because my, uh, my first, uh, first two bands, uh, a great friend of mine, uh, Paul, Paul De Benedictus, um, he went to Berkeley. And so after high school, our, you know, our band broke up and he went to Berkeley and I was at a different school and we were looking to start a new band together. And so we put up the flyers all around and um, everyone was like, you know, we want to start a metal hardcore thing. And everyone's like, oh, is it like Dream Theater? Like, no, <laughs> no not, not at all. What? No. <laughs> no, like Earth Crisis, Shia Lude, you know, kind of like yeah. that like what what are you talking about <laughs> oh my god it's it's like dream theater but with a vision of disorder vibe and also exactly. the songs are this short yeah <laughs> just like that i wanted to talk about being a metal brewery and uh rope in trevor's experience on the road and exploring breweries and stumbling across metal breweries why exactly did you open a metal themed brewery like <laughs> i well I, the, the truth is i didn't we didn't um we like if you look at all of our presence and uh, how do i put this there's certain breweries in the country that are metal and when you walk in the whole place is painted black and there's some you know obscure you know the 14th track on a swallow the sun record playing and and it's and it's off to me it's awesome and to my friends it's awesome but you know, the artwork is, is, you know, evil and aggressive and whatnot. And then there's some breweries that are not like that because like us, we, we realize that the, our, like financially, especially in the area that we're in right here, our biggest, most uh, well spent or, you know, high spending clientele are not interested in metal. So we made a conscious decision that even though we were opening as metalheads, we were going to be more accessible, but we were going to be known as the metal brewery that doesn't look like it's metal. So there's breweries around the country like Adroit Theory and Wake and True and stuff. Like these guys are, you know, they're metal. When you walk in this place, you're, with the exception of the stage where you know there's music, you're never going to know it's, it's what the kind of the connection is. And you know, a little piece of me gets kind of bummed out about that because I do see some dudes that walk in with like an Acacia Strange shirt on or something and I'm like, you know, I gravitate as an owner towards them and I want to talk to them. But I know that, you know, if they were walking in and everything was painted black and there was like blood red curtains on the walls and stuff, they would probably be more into it. But when they walk in first, they're like, why I don't really, you know, I don't, I don't know this place. I heard it was a metal spot. Then when the, then, you know, when then some sort of old school metal tune comes on music or you see our, you know, our bartender is wearing a Shia Lude shirt, one of his favorite bands. Um, you'll see them start to get quiz, you know, inquisitive and be like, what's going on with this place? So we, we didn't open a metal spot, but uh, we wanted to be connected with metal as much as we could. And so it's kind of worked out because we, you know, we have a great following of people that the last thing they want to hear is me get up and play a set of deathcore music. But at the same time, they, they love it here. And so we, we try to kind of walk a line. Does that make sense? 
Very interesting. And how about you, Trevor, uh, in all your touring experience, have you ever been surprised to have stumbled across a metal brewery that you weren't aware of, something cool like that? Um, there's a place in Ottawa. Um, I don't believe it's a brewery. It's, a, it's, it's more of a restaurant. It's a bar. Uh, it's called The Coven, and that place yes. uh, is awesome. Uh, they yes. have all the, the, the metal-themed uh, sandwiches and, and just any kind of dish you want. And it's it, it's funny because it's something that we've had an idea of for years. They just something we joke about on the road about you know, naming certain you know dishes after bands like the Dill Dillinger Escape Clam, uh, the Black Dot <laughs> Burger, you know stuff like that. You know, it, it's when you're in the van for a long time, it's just it's just endless the possibilities. Um, you start naming after records and stuff, but um. That place is great. Uh, that burger may, may have been the best burger I've had in all of Canada. Um, it was really, really good. Uh, and the beer that they had there was fantastic as well. It was a cool spot. So other than that, I mean, we live, you know, in, in the Boston area. There's not a lot of metal themed, you know, breweries or, or restaurants out here. Um, there's a lot of catering. Like, like Mike said, there, there's a lot of catering to the clientele there in the area. So unfortunately, we don't get to see it um out here um but you know I'm, I'm i would gladly go into uh a metal themed you know restaurant there's a place in japan uh, in osaka called the rock rock that is a metal themed bar but it's not it's not, it's not a brewery that's it's, it's pretty pretty unreal spot to, to go to very cool very good and yes absolute huge shout out to medi the owner of that ottawa burger joint called the coven with called the Co yes, called the Coven with a K, and there actually is a Cryptopsy burger. Which which burger did oh. you eat? I don't remember, it was about a year and a half ago, yes. and it was fucking delicious. Um, <laughs> Tell them it's the Cryptopsy burger. It was a Cryptopsy burger. <laughs> was that, that's the one. <laughs> I, I think it had jalapenos. I think it had, had jalapenos, but it had a lot of cheese. I do Very cool. I, I, the Cryptopsy burger has a lot of cheese on it, and I know that because I'm a vegan. And when I saw him, I was like, "Dude, <laughs> <laughs> dude, <laughs> Chris is a vegetarian. Too I'm much. a vegan. This is not going to work." <laughs> uh, let's wrap is this up. Pardon? Is it a veggie burger? It is not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they have good cow flesh there. It's delicious. That's what I've heard. <laughs> Let's wrap this up with a classic box and hops wrap up question. Uh, it probably never happens to you guys because you're you're very controlled individuals and you know what's going on and you know how to handle yourselves. But every once in a while, it happens to everyone. What is your hangover cure? Uh, wow, there's real no cure. Like there's there's no real cure for when it's really bad, besides trying to sleep and pound water. Um, but if it's one of the ones that you can deal with, then it's usually, you know, an egg, egg and cheese sandwich and um, a lot of iced coffee. How about you, Mike? I'm, I'm coffee and Bloody Marys. Bloody Marys are what get me through some rough, rough mornings. <laughs> but coffee, too. Coffee is crucial. But, I love it. I love it. Everybody, please go to Broken Goblet Brewing tomorrow. Pick up the Black Hearts Now Rain Russian Imperial Stout brewed with white chocolate. All of the proceeds will be going towards the ACLU for Philly and Boston. Uh, if I could be there, I would be there, but I'm not allowed to come into your country just yet. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, am, I am super, super stoked to have had the chance to have a chat with you guys. Uh, massive cheers, and I greatly appreciate you guys being with me. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. What a great chat. I really, really, really stand behind this Black Hearts Now Rain collaborative brew. I love the reason that they made it. I love the message behind it. And the Vox and Hops podcast supports that 1,000%. As I mentioned in the intro... 
that disclaimer, this episode was recorded on November 10th. If you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should absolutely go and subscribe to it on the podcast platform of your choice because there are over 200 Vox and Hops episodes just like this one that you can go back and enjoy. But not only that, you should go rate and write a review for the podcast because if you do that, more people just like you will discover the Vox and Hops podcast. Vox and Hops is brought to you by Sound Talent Media. I hope you guys have a great weekend. I hope you get to relax and enjoy some time. I hope that you, if you live up here in Montreal are coming out to La Canette or heading over to Overhop Canada in saint jean sur richelieu to pick up the Vox and Hops Overhop Canada Collaborative Brew. The double dry hopped New England IPA called Vox and Overhops is now available and you should absolutely go pick it up and enjoy it. I know that I shall be doing that. I'll be back next week with two episodes, but until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops. Oh, no, no, no.